Let's get going. So, Call of Duty Modern Warfare has weathered strong criticism since last week's announcement that its survival mode will be a year-long PS4 exclusive. Now, as we discussed in our report, the backlash from Xbox and PC players was fierce, and there's been even more negative sentiment in the community thanks to leaks indicating that Modern Warfare's loot boxes are going to end up being anything but cosmetic only. So, loot boxes and microtransactions have historically been very contentious topics within the Call of Duty community, with the very aggressive monetization strategy being employed in Black Ops 4, well, representing just the peak of negative sentiment towards the practice from players of the game. Now, many believed that Black Ops 4's cosmetic unlock system started off fairly enough, but then opinions shifted once the loot boxes were added into the monetization angle of the game further on into its life cycle, especially because eventually they started having exclusive weapons be included within supply drops. And yes, that did mean that gameplay changing weapons were locked behind either extreme luck or, for many people, a paywall as they just purchase the loot boxes. Now, with Modern Warfare, they've always been, well, conspicuously silent on the topic of their business model. They've said good things like there won't be a season pass and that all the maps will be free, but of course, that's led many people to be suspicious. Now, sadly, if the various leaks circulating around the internet are to be believed, fairness has uh, gone out the window and loot boxes are back with weapons in them. Of course, the Call of Duty community has not been shy in voicing out their thoughts on each of the above decisions, and what's interesting is that apparently some of those voices are getting through. So, developer Infinity Ward took to Reddit to address the most recent drama, and to assure fans that the team are doing their best uh, to deliver an enjoyable experience. Now, the post is, you know, claiming that Infinity Ward regularly checked the fan communities, and that they requested those communities to continue offering feedback, which, I mean, of course they would say, it is what you would say there. And that was a well-received post. However, as we discussed last Last week, it's really not up to Infinity Ward to put out these fires. A lot of these decisions are not made by Infinity Ward, and uh, the exclusivity and microtransaction decisions, they ultimately do seem to be Activision's call. And even the fan backlash appears to be getting through to Activision on this one. So, a prominent Call of Duty leaker, Gaming Revolution, who has been accurate in the past with aspects of Call of Duty Modern Warfare, posted on Twitter that Activision and Infinity Ward last week held an emergency meeting on the subject of of loot boxes. Now, the post outlines that Activision is reacting to the community backlash in the light of the game, losing a large number of pre-orders. Now, that is very interesting. Maybe, you know, people being angry doesn't matter, but once it actually starts hitting the pre-orders, that's when they'll listen. Activision are also said to be working with Infinity War to reevaluate how the supply drops are actually implemented. Now, Gaming Revolution writes that nothing regarding the microtransactions is set in stone, and uh, that from what we've seen, evidently it's a fluid process that ultimately boils down to how greedy Activision are feeling on the day. Now, of course, that's just what he said. That is his take on things. Of course, they're still just leaks, and they should be taken with a pinch of salt. However, if significant changes do actually appear, it could be taken as a victory for fan activism. Perhaps exclusivity of an entire game won't damage the sales that much, uh, as in the case with Borderlands 3, but maybe in a case like this, where it is so blatantly unfair with the platform-specific ex um, exclusivity of a mode and the microtransactions transactions being clearly gameplay impacting, maybe that means it actually, well, will have an impact, and that it will have caused those pre-orders to drop enough that Activision actually take notice of it. Next up, VG247 recently got a chance to sit down with Rockstar to chat about the future of Red Dead Online, and by their own admission, they couldn't resist asking whether or not single-player DLC would be coming in the future. Of course, it's not looking that promising. According to Rockstar's lead online production associate, Katie Pika, the team are 100 100% focused on online right now. And the reason for this focus is that Rockstar are, quote, hoping to bring everything that a player can love about single player into the online world and fleshed out. So, it appears that the intention is to align the online experience with, uh, well, offline, seemingly, to have that story stuff happen in online. Of course, having a laser focus on the online experience, that does work well with the sort of model the Rockstar is going for these days. The online platforms that Red Dead Online and Grand Theft Auto Online are, well, they offer a consistent revenue stream, and uh, GTA Online is a proven financial success. So it makes sense that this is Rockstar's priority. Indeed, a studio putting all of their efforts into single-player 
only content, that's becoming quite rare. That's something that is seen to only make business sense if it's going to be a platform seller, be it of course a game system like the PlayStation 4 or a subscription platform like say Origin Access through uh, you know which you'll be able to say get Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order and maybe that's why Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order actually makes financial sense for EA. Anyway, of course CD Projekt Red could be viewed as an exception to this rule because of games like The Witcher 3 and Cyberpunk 2077, but it's worth remembering that they're based in Poland. Their costs of development are so much lower per staff member than uh, than these other studios in North America, and that means that the, you know, large blockbuster single player is going to be a lot more profitable for them because of their reduced costs. So uh, really as long as game development is go like focused in these hyper expensive clusters, yeah, we're going to have this situation where the focus is a bit more on profitability, or, I mean, at the very least, as long as gaming is more driven by the parent companies and their bottom line, yeah, you're going to see a shift towards profitability, things like, you know, the online modes over just some single player DLC, which is unfortunate because I really would have preferred some single player DLC, but hey, that's just me. Then next, we've been getting a steady trickle of Last of Us 2 information since last week's State of Play show. And towards the end of last week, the developers took to Twitter to confirm that The Last of Us Part 2 will not contain an online multiplayer component. Now, the reason for this decision is that, quote, as development began on the evolution of the factions mode from The Last of Us Part 1, the vision of the team grew beyond an additional mode that could be included within the enormous single player campaign. And while this may seem like short term bad news, it may May well pay off in the long run because, uh, well, the post goes on to say that players will eventually experience the fruits of the team's ambitions, but not as part of The Last of Us Part 2. And this very well could indicate that we soon will have a standalone online multiplayer focused adventure set within the world of The Last of Us, which certainly does sound quite cool, though there are, you know, concerns about like, what will the monetization be like? How will an online live service like game actually happen if it's made by Naughty Dog? I mean, if anyone's going to do it right, Right, I kind of trust them, given that, uh, well, their games have been, I would say, upfront, honest, and respectable in how they've been executed thus far. Though, of course, we go from good to bad thanks to our good friends at EA. A number of Redditors have reported that EA are closing threads that detail bugs and glitches found in FIFA 20's career mode, as well as deleting any posts mentioning how players can obtain refunds. One comment shared that they posted a collection of bugs in career mode, and that the thread was immediately shut down, and that they were banned. So, this is a clear attempt on the part of EA to lock down criticism, and of course it's one that will just serve as another example of the Streisand effect, because what is, like, what's everyone talking about now? FIFA 20's offline career mode being a bit bugged, and uh, that's a big problem because that's been a popular feature for years, and as much as Ultimate Team is the focus, and as hard as it may be for EA to accept uh, that people actually do like the other mode, it really still does suck for people who, you know, don't like Ultimate Team, but do like FIFA's mechanics, and thus want the the career mode. Now, of course, you can be more conspiratorial here. FIFA Ultimate Team is their big revenue generator, and with career mode being damaged, well, they have less of an incentive to fix it, right? Indeed, they've said that fixes are coming, but not in the game's initial patch. Uh, more likely, I think that, uh, you know, the multitude of bugs and the lack of polish, I think that's mainly just indicative of a brazen lack of effort on EA's part, thanks to FIFA Ultimate Team being the big money maker, and that they will have known that these bugs existed, but they will not have considered them to be things worth delaying the release. And then next, let's hop over to the quickfire section of the video. So, I went to play Age of Empires 2 HD last week, only to be thwarted by a Steam outage. Indeed, many people reported not being able to use even offline mode because of the server not connecting so that you could turn it on. And sure, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but of course, there is a workaround where, you know, you can kill your own internet and that will force Steam to launch in its offline mode, whereupon games can actually be played offline without Steam looking for an internet connection. But, the reason why I bring this up is because as much as Steam is popular and as much as, you know, Gabin's a good old meme and Valve are always seen as the good guys, something like Steam going down, that quickly reveals the problems in having your content be tied into a platform. I'll just say it this way, problems like this did not occur with Age of Empires 2 Original Edition, right? When you were just launching an EXE file on your computer, you know, this didn't happen back when the game's interaction flow was just the same as launching a regular piece of software. So as much as we are all, you know, a lot of people are invested, I suppose, in these platform wars and, you know, they're, you know, betting on a certain horse, I'm still just going to come out and say that 
fundamentally, there are risks here, and if Steam goes away, yeah, your games kinda will go away too. Then next, a quick chuckle at Fallout 76. So the US Product Safety Commission issued a recall notice for the wearable Fallout 76 power armor helmet included with the limited edition of the game because of a mold concern. But it turned out that it was only related to the GameStop exclusive Nuka-Cola edition. Now, this edition sold 32 units out of a total of 20,000. That's less than 1% of the total units manufactured, far less than one. So yeah, uh, basically it's a bit wild. Like it was so little, the GameStop actually just contacted each of the affected customers directly. But I think what really matters here is that, that like they made so many of these, it shows that they had very bullish expectations going into Fallout 76's launch. Expectations that I think quite obviously were not met because guess what, they didn't sell 20,000 of them. Then next up, Apex Legends is having its third season drop. It's got a new gun, a new character, and a new map. And the new map is, uh, it's got an ice and fire theme, and it seems to be bringing some new, like, environmental mechanics, even including a train. Overall, it seems like a solid enough update to a game that I think certainly does need a little bit more spice injected into its veins. Then over the weekend, Ubisoft announced that it would be opening up a new office in Vietnam. Uh, located in Da Nang, the new studio is going to be focusing on mobile development, and they hope to recruit 100 people over the next three years. I think, as you can see, it's another move into uh, into Asia, it's another move into mobile, and that is somewhat of a trend recently. And then next, let's wrap up the new releases. So, Destiny 2 Shadowkeep launches this week, along with their new free-to-play experience. It's the first big move from Bungie, now that they're free from Activision, and it's one that'll admit I'm quite excited for indeed. We then also have Ghost Recon Breakpoint, the follow-up to the top-selling Wildlands, and uh, one that seems to have more of a live service focus, with them recently posting another really big big roadmap uh, post, and it certainly seems like this game is having more of its uh, elements be inspired by The Division's success. So uh, I'm not really sure where I am on it. Uh, I, I, like, apparently parts of Wildlands were pretty good, but uh, I mean, I do come from the the more old school Ghost Recons, like the way back, the first few of them. So uh, yeah, it's pretty different to what I know. Anyway, that's it for today's episode of The Roundup. Let me know if there's any stories you're interested in, what you thought about the ones today. Be sure to like, subscribe, and ring that bell. And with that, I will see you next time.